Please welcome Mahesh and Jason. Hi, I'm Jason. This is my colleague Mahesh. Uh, so today we're going to talk about some of the challenges building storage for the Facebook control plane. And we're going to talk about a system that we're building called Delos that addresses those challenges. So you heard a little bit about the control plane during Ben's keynote. And what I'm going to do is define this for you. So I'm going to step back and show you the entire Facebook software ecosystem. And the analogy I like to use is like a house. It has nothing to do with the fact that I'm buying a house right now. Um, we're going to take the top, the main floor of the house is essentially the services that you're familiar with uh, running at Facebook. So we have front end services like web servers. There's a bunch of back end services like those that are training machine learning models. There are data stores. We have data stores with rich APIs like the MySQL relational database which is used extensively at Facebook. We have data stores with simple APIs like a key value store like ZipEDB also used extensively at Facebook. But all these services need more foundational services to run. This is the foundation of your house. Uh, this is the control plane. Think of this like cluster schedulers, resource allocators. So where there are thousands of services there on the top level, there are less services on the control plane, but they're super vitally important. And they're also, they also need to store their data persistently. And so if that's the foundation, here's the bedrock of your house, control plane storage, which is storing the metadata for these control plane services. And we've heard about one instance already, which again is Zookeeper from Ben's keynote, which when we began this project was being used extensively to store uh, control plane metadata. So why is this picture incomplete? Why are we not done? Well, it turns out that control plane storage has a lot of requirements. Some of these you're familiar with from any type of reliable storage. Some of these are unique to the control plane. So, of course, it has to be highly available. If our control plane storage is down, the control plane is down, and all those services up top are going to have a bad time. It has to be highly consistent. If we allocate two resource intensive jobs to the same machine, then none of those jobs is going to perform well. Again, the higher level services are going to have a bad time. So far, this looks like a traditional reliable storage system. One thing that might not be apparent is control plane services sometimes need a very rich API. Uh, for example, the ability to execute complex queries over thousands of rows of data, millions of rows of data with complex predicates, so, uh, secondary indices, some form of query planning, and, and so on. So some of these storage options that we see there don't necessarily support that complexity for the API. So ZipEDB, it's got a key value store. You'd have to layer a lot of complexity at the application layer in order to use it. Zookeeper has a more powerful file system API, but yet it, it can't do a lot of the things that I just described. Another requirement for control plane storage is it has to really run on a wide variety of hardware. Why is this? Well, it's because your control plane storage needs to be located with the control plane services themselves. If a data center becomes isolated, you don't want it to go down. You don't want the control plane services to go down because they can't talk to storage outside of the data center. Not all the data centers at Facebook have the latest and greatest hardware with the best CPUs, the latest and greatest flash. There's a variety of, 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 of hardwares out there that are really suited for the, the uses in that data center. And in order to run control plane storage, you really have to run on, a rely, on, on all these different types of hardware. And the final requirement, which is, uh, which is very unique to control plane storage, is we have to be ruthless about eliminating dependencies, in particular cyclic dependencies. So what do I mean by this? Well, a dependency is when one service relies on another. We're going to hear about this during, the, uh, during the, uh, data, the data recovery talk coming up later in the conference. So in this case, um, the services at the higher level rely on things like the cluster scheduler in the control plane. If the control plane is down, they can't run. But what happens when we store data in a, in a system like MySQL? Well, now we have a dependency going up. We have a cyclical dependency. If we need to start up the, a data center after disaster, how do we do this? Well, we need the storage to be running before we can run the control plane services, but we need the control plane services before we can run the storage. And so it's a chicken or the egg problem that 
uh, becomes very hard to manage. The way to solve this is to be very ruthless about eliminating all these cyclical dependencies and put your control plane storage at the bottom of the stack and depend on nothing or as close to nothing as you can get. So one thing when we started this project, we looked around and we said, okay, well, there's a lot of control plane services out there. And what's happening is they're starting to scatter their storage solutions among a large number of different storage options, none of which really meets all these needs. And so they're all a little bit imperfect. So some are storing their data in MySQL because they want that rich API. A lot are storing their data in Zookeeper. And they're pretty happy with it because Zookeeper is well tested at Facebook. It's a rock. But other services are using Zookeeper. but they are struggling with the fact that Zookeeper constrains the size of data that can be stored in a single ensemble. So using compression, sharding, a lot of application-specific techniques, and they're really nervous about exceeding that maximum size. Others are trying to layer a rich API on top of Zookeeper, and so there's a lot of application logic, um, and Ben talked a lot about this in the, in the keynote a little bit. Um, so what do we want to do in this project? We want to take all of these requirements, we want to meet them in a single system, this is Delos, and we're gonna migrate the control plane storage, the metadata, into this single system, and we're gonna meet all their needs. So easier said than done, right? Because when we think about this, there are a lot of requirements, and we have this added time pressure that all of these control plane services are starting to scatter their solutions across a variety of different options. So first of all, we need to get something out there quickly so we can start to bring the control plane services under a common umbrella. Once this gets set in stone, it becomes really hard to migrate things back. So this is their short-term need. In the medium term, we need to scale out to run the most challenging workloads in terms of performance that these control plane services had. We need to address the diversity of hardware and run across all the data centers in Facebook. And then in the long term, what we need to do in the project is we need to really attack all these cyclical dependencies and make sure we get rid of all of them. So how could you do this? Well, you could just throw a bunch of software engineers at the problem. You know, get three teams. You say, team A, you're the short-term team. Get something out there quickly. Team B, you start working in parallel, working on scaling out. Team C, you work on the cyclical dependencies. A lot of you are building distributed systems now. You know, building a single distributed storage system is enormously complex. You've got to get the protocol right. You've got to test it. The nervousness about putting this out in production that Ben talked about, that's real, right? And, and so doing this once is really hard. Doing this twice, that's insane. Doing it three times is just never going to happen. So we needed a different approach. And so what we decided to do was really invest a lot of time up front coming up with clean abstractions that allow us to build a distributed storage solution in a very modular way that isolates the various components. And our hope was we could first come out with some components that were based upon some existing software and get something up and running really quickly. And then we could start meeting these medium and long-term goals by popping out the components one by one, pushing in new components that address different aspects of the system without changing the whole thing over and over again. And so this is what my colleague Mahesh is going to talk about, at least our first steps along that journey. Thanks, Jason. So um, Jason described the need for this plug-and-play architecture for building replicated storage systems. And I'm going to talk about what Delis is and how it achieves these goals. So Delis is a replicated storage system. Each server in Delis has some local state. This state can be anything. It can be a queue, a table, some kind of tree. Uh, in this case, it happens to be a table. And in other systems, keeping these copies of state synchronized typically requires a very complex distributed protocol. One of the key ideas in Delis is that instead of using a complex distributed protocol, we instead use a shared log. So we have this abstraction of a shared log. It's magical, it's durable, highly available, sits across the network. And one of the things I'm going to show you is that given such a log, um, we can very easily replicate state on top. So above the shared log abstraction, you really don't have any kind of complex message passing distributed protocol. The shared log itself can be a distributed um, system that's fairly complex, but above the shared log, life is easy. So in the next uh, slide or so, I'm going to drill down into this assertion, that if I give you a magical shared log that doesn't fail, it's highly available, durable, uh, and performant, that you can replicate state above it fairly easily. So consider an application 
running on a, you know, on Delos. So you have the a Delos server. The server is exposing a table abstraction to the application, and the server is maintaining a local view of the state, which we store in RocksDB. Now, when the application does any kind of mutating operation on the table, for example, some kind of put or a conditional put, the Delos runtime packages that operation, serializes it, and appends it to the shared log. Okay. Now, the shared log has operations made by other nodes at the same time. It's serializing all of these operations. And what goes into the shared log is a description of the operation. Think of it as some kind of a lambda. We haven't actually executed the operation yet. At this point, the Delos server plays forward the shared log and applies these updates to its local state. And at that point, it can return back to the application. So there are a few takeaways here. The first is this is a fairly simple protocol, right? There are no RPCs going on. Um, it's just operations on the log. The second takeaway is that you can take this stack, this, this, this flow of operations, and you can divide it into two parts. The top part is extremely aware of the fact that it's replicating a table. The bottom half of the stack has no idea what it's replicating. The log doesn't actually know what it's storing. And this has a very important implication. We can change the API of Delos very easily just by changing the top, uh, a, a very thin layer of code at the top of the stack. This means that you can have a queue, a relational database, different kinds of tables, it doesn't matter. Um, you can have any kind of API on top without messing around with the distributed protocols at the bottom. Okay, so pluggable API, that's one of these features. Now, I told you that if I give you a magical shared log, life is easy, and that's what the last slide was about. Um, where do you get this log from? So we had this, you know, as Jason mentioned, we needed to deploy something really quickly. At Facebook, we move fast. And, and so we didn't have the time to sit and build a brand new distributed shared log from scratch. So here's what we did. Um, we took an existing service, uh, we took Zookeeper, which Ben talked about in the morning, and we layered a log API on top of Zookeeper. So Facebook has a Zookeeper service. It's really the most reliable storage system in the company. It does not fail. Um, and so we layered our, our log on top, and the pros of doing so were that we got a log running very quickly, and this was a very reliable solution. Now, the con is this graph, right? Um, this is a throughput latency graph. Um, and that's not a good graph. That, that's a really slow log. And this is not Zookeeper's fault. Zookeeper actually runs a lot faster than this. But it just has to do with the fact that we're doing something unnatural. Jason's going to go into this more in a couple of slides. But we were taking a log API and mapping it to the Zookeeper API, which internally is using a log, by the way. Um, and so by the time you do all of this, your performance is gone. And also, we now had a, you know, we didn't get rid of the cyclical dependency. We now had a dependency on Zeus, on Zookeeper. So to get around this, we needed to replace our log. We were already in deployment, in production at this point. You know, six months, eight months into the project, um, we managed to go into production, but we needed to somehow change our ordering layer because this was not sufficient performance. And to do this, we came up with a new abstraction called the virtual log. Now, this is cutting edge research, by the way. This does not exist out there. What is a virtual log? It's, it's what it is. It's, you know, you virtualize the log. Um, why do you want to do that? Because if you virtualize the log, you can map different segments of this virtual log to different underlying physical logs. Okay? So at the beginning of, the, of time, you, know, you have one underlying physical log. Your virtual log maps entirely to it. It's just a virtual address space. And what you can do now is seal that physical log and move the virtual log to a brand new configuration where the data actually resides on some other log implementation. I'm going to call this the native log. This is a log implementation we built. Jason's going to talk about it next. The high level bit though is we are able to reconfigure a system to use entirely different logs dynamically, right? Which means we can upgrade logs on the fly and furthermore, you know, if the membership of this native log changes or there is some configuration change, we can use exactly the same mechanism 
to reconfigure again. So we have a very powerful general purpose reconfiguration primitive. And this is really the first system that can reconfigure entire log, entire ordering subsystems. Other systems can reconfigure the set of machines and so on. We can just change the entire logging protocol. So the second big takeaway is that we have a pluggable log. Okay, we had a pluggable API. I showed you that two slides back. And we also have a pluggable log. And now I'm going to turn it um, over to Jason, who's going to tell you what this native log is. So let's leverage this, this uh, pluggable log. So setting the stage, you know, eight months into the project, we're out there, we're in production, we're storing valuable control plane metadata. That's a victory. You know, getting a system out there, a complex distributed system out there that fast is a huge win. But now we need to meet those, we need to meet some challenges. And Mahesh talked about some of these. So first of all, we're slow. We have this impedance mismatch. We're building one protocol on top of another protocol and a lot of hilarity results out of that. So what we're gonna do to address this is we're gonna build a protocol that's specifically designed to support a distributed shared log and eliminate that mismatch, that mismatch entirely. The second problem we have is we've got cyclical dependencies. So we're putting our entire log in Zookeeper, and Zookeeper is moving, actually moving up the stack at Facebook and becoming more of a higher level service. And so we want to eliminate that dependency. Finally, we have this problem that Zookeeper has a maximum size that it can support an ensemble. It's several gigabytes in size, but whenever the log stops getting trimmed, we get really nervous in production, and we want to eliminate this. So what we're going to do is we're going to move from storing the log in Zookeeper to storing the log natively on the local disks of the machines that are running Delos, and that means that we're going to get a several order magnitude improvement in the maximum log size that we can have at any given time. So. The protocol that I'm going to describe to you is actually going to be a very simple protocol. We're going to use the fact that Delos is implementing a lot of the complexity in other modules to focus on speed and simplicity. Um, whenever we have a problem, when the, we have a primary, the sequencer goes down, we're going to operate on a, on a, on a, with a fixed set of replicas, a single sequencer. If a sequencer goes down, if a replica gets preempted, what we're going to do is we're going to rely on the virtual log to reconfigure us out of trouble and just simply move to a new configuration in that virtual log. And in fact, once we have this really powerful hammer, everything looks like a nail. All the corner cases that come up in distributed systems, and there are a lot of them, we can almost always hit with this reconfiguration hammer. And this is beautiful because it gives us one single solution that's well-tested, used all the time, that can get us out of a lot of trouble. So I'm going to give you a flavor of the native log protocol. We're designing this for a shared log. There are really two basic operations that go on all the time. You append to the end of the log, and then you play the log. You find the tail of the log, you read everything from the previous tail, and you apply it to your materialized view. So let me talk about how writes work. This is gonna look, for those of you that do, do distributed systems, it's gonna, gonna look like a fairly basic quorum protocol, because it is. We have a primary, we call this a sequencer. Each client wants, wants to append data to the log, it sends the data to the sequencer, it says, where, you know, put this in the log. The sequencer picks a position, farms it out to the replicas, and the replicas write it. So whenever a replica writes it to its local disk, we say that it's locally committed. In this case, we've committed X at position zero. And once a majority has committed the data, the sequencer can reply back to the client and say, yep, that data's in the log, it's been globally committed. So that's a write, it's fairly simple. How do reads work? The first thing we have to do is we have to find the tail. We need to do this for linearizability reasons and durability reasons. So the client, any client can go and ask the replicas, where is your tail? Normally, the replicas are going to agree, and when they agree, we're all done. Once we get a majority to say, hey, the tail is here, we have an answer. Sometimes, things go a little awry. So let's say our first replica says, hey, my tail's at one. The t replica on the right says my tail's at zero. The replica in the middle, it's out to lunch. It doesn't get back to us. We don't know where the tail is. This is actually synchronization. And as I tell my students in my professor role, all synchronization involves waiting. So the solution here is we have to wait for something to happen. Either the middle replica is going to get back to us and say, hey, guess what, my tail's at one, in which case we know that the global tail is in fact at one, or that replica on the right is going to catch up, it's going to apply um, X to the first position in its log, and I'm waiting for my slides to catch up here, um, and again, the tail is going to be at one. So finally, once we establish the tail, reading from the log is really simple. 
We know that it's there. We can ask any replica for the data. If the replica has it, great. If the replica doesn't have it, we just move on to the next replica. A majority of them have the data, so we're going to find it eventually. Um, in the vast majority of cases, we're going to find it in our local logs, so we can get the data very fast without any network operation at all. So there's a lot more in, in, in the native log, but basically the one flavor you should get out of this is that it's super simple. Um, I didn't talk about what happens when the primary fails. I didn't talk about what happens when replicas start failing because all that is handled by the virtual log at the reconfiguration layer. So this is my favorite graph. This is the first time that Delos native log went into production. So what we're doing here in this graph is in our first data center, we're literally switching on the fly through a reconfiguration from the Zookeeper protocol to the native log. So we're literally changing the entire ordering protocol of our distributed system without bringing down the systems that are using it. As Mahesh said, this, as far as I know, this is a capability that no other distributed system has. Um, and you notice there's no disruption to the services that are using this. Well, if you look in the graph in the bottom right, you'll see that there's a small latency spike, so not completely. The second thing you can notice by looking at this graph, though, is performance immediately improves. The cool thing is this is a log scale, so our, our write latency is getting five times better. Our read latency is getting 10 times better. And it's even a better story than this, because we're moving from pretty well-optimized log implementation to the first iteration, the unoptimized native log, so it's even gotten better than this over time. So now we've got the native log out. The best part about this story, because of the plug and play architecture, we did this in four months. We just changed the native log, we changed nothing out with, with the rest of the system, and we met our medium term goals. Okay, so now I'm gonna hand it back to Mahesh and he's gonna talk about our current work, which is addressing those long term goals. Thanks, Jason. So um, I'm going to show you this kind of architecture diagram, um, where you know this is what we described, this is what we have in production, you have this table API on top, and then you have the virtual log in the middle. The virtual log stores its metadata currently in Zookeeper. That is a detail on one of the slides I, I didn't highlight. Um, and then at the bottom, you have these two log implementations. We have the ability to switch back and forth. Now, a lot of the point of this is, you know, we're, we're just at the beginning. The, the fun is going to start now because we can start putting new implementations of these boxes. So one of the things we are doing is implementing a native metadata store for the virtual log. Um, if we do this, then we are completely self-sufficient and we don't have cyclical dependencies anymore, right? So that's one focus. But beyond that, we are also uh, really investing now on new APIs. So Delos is a platform. It's not a single storage system. We want teams to come with their APIs because they understand their application requirements and build these thin shim layers on top. So one of the things we're doing is a, you know, a, a variant of the Zookeeper API, the storage subset of it. Something else we're doing is a queue. And so we can, you know, pluggable API, we can plug in a new API very easily. And we can also plug in new log implementations. So something we're doing is trying with protocols like log device, which is an open source Facebook system that's basically a distributed shared log. And we're able to again switch back and forth between the native log and log device very easily. Um, if you're going to take one thing away from this, it's that Dallas is a platform, and the nice thing about platforms, the nice thing about abstractions, is that they enable innovation. So we expect the people we work with, the teams we work with, to innovate. If you have a new idea for an ordering protocol, if you have a new idea for an API, your time to deployment is very quick because you don't have to rebuild all of this complex distributed stuff. I'm going to show you one graph. Um, telling you why it's so important to be able to change the log implementation. So uh, this you already saw, this was the Zookeeper log, um, that's the sorry looking graph. Uh, and this is the kind of nicer looking native log graph where we get better performance, right? Um, with log device, it's interesting, we get a trade off. Um, because log device is what I'd call a disaggregated log, it resides on a different set of machines, we're using more resources. And so we, we, we get this trade-off where with log device, we get higher latency but higher throughput. So at low throughput, the native log is better, but at high throughput, log device is better. And this is the kind of trade-off we can make with Delos that other systems can't. Um, and we can do this dynamically. So you can actually change on the fly as your workload changes. So to conclude, um, you know, Jason described the control plane, um, why you know, why it's challenging, why it's important. 
Um, we have this requirement of low dependencies and, and also these systems have very diverse requirements for API and performance. Existing storage systems are mon monolithic. Um, you can't really build one system for each use case. And Delos provides a pluggable API and pluggable ordering. And so um, the practical outcome of that is we are able to hit deployment very quickly. And once we hit deployment, we're able to change systems on the fly safely and quickly. Thank you. We'll take questions now. <laughs>